Hi everyone, this is Coach Becky from Doc Wayne, and I'm here with Coach Amanda and Kendra McDonald from Samaritans, and we're excited that you took your time today to be with us. We're also um, on Facebook Live today, so hello to everyone on Facebook Live. Um, and today we um, are speaking about kids, um, suicide prevention, and student athletes. So we're gonna give it one more minute as people trickle in on Facebook Live and here on our Zoom broadcast. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. So welcome to our fourth segment of Kids and COVID-19 and our second webinar. This webinar is in partnership with Samaritans. And thank you all for listening and prioritizing mental health today. Um, as the health in our communities continues to improve during this uh, pandemic, it's important to note that we're just at the beginning of this secondary mental health pandemic. Um, and the implications of social isolation and the toxic stress upon all of us will continue for years. So today's topic on suicide prevention is always relevant, but particularly important during this time. And additionally, for the provider community, and we have two providers on the call, um, Amanda Seferman from Doc Wayne um, and myself, are seeing that the increase in need for services is just um, abundantly clear. And as we see the reentry to sport and the reentry to school, um, we just know that kids are going to need more and more services. Um, and what we really are interested in talking about today is this issue of suicide prevention and the other helpers in the community. So coaches, teachers, paraprofessionals, and those who may not have clinical training, but who are trusted by our youth. Um, and so we thank you for your time and for investing your time in um, the suicide prevention training. Um, and so from the sport lens, um, suicide prevention is one of those skills that you put the practice in and it shows up when you need it most. Um, so when the game's on the line and when, when the youth is in front of you and you know that you've invested that time in your practice and your training, you're able to show up for them. Um, I also wanna be aware of all the stress that is being put on us. Um, so all the folks that are in the community supporting these kids and wanna send a message of hope and resilience that there are certainly things that can be done for kids um, and for student athletes and we're here to share some of those tips and tools with you today. Um, and Kendra is really an expert in this space around suicide prevention, so we're really happy to have her today. So if you're not familiar with Doc Wayne, just wanna share a little bit about what we do. So our mission is to fuse sport and therapy to heal and strengthen at-risk youth. And when we're not in a pandemic, we're usually providing sport-based group therapy services and individual uh, therapy services to kids and families in schools, community centers, and residential treatment facilities. But now we've transitioned to uh, telehealth services. Um, and you can always reach us at support at docwayne.org or on our website at docwayne.org. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Amanda, um, to give a little introduction and some logistics, and then she's going to pass it over to Kendra. Becky, you'll need to unmute her again. There you go. Sorry about that, Amanda. I think you're good to go now. 
Yes, I am. Thank you so much. My name is Amanda Seiferman. I'm the program manager at Doc Wayne Youth Services. Um, and I've been working at Doc Wayne for about five years and just utilizing the sport-based group therapy that we do and helping transition everybody over to our telehealth services. Um, I think it's important for us to mention as well that um, any, we are talking about suicide and it's a pretty heavy topic, um, but when, if you do feel like any of these things are describing you, we tend to be talking about kids in these because it's, we're helpers and we want to make sure that um, we're supporting these students. But at the same time, if any of these things are um, applying to you or if it is triggering, um, most mental health um, conversations can be triggering to different people. Um, just making sure that you're acknowledging this, taking space. If you do need to get up and walk away from your computer, we understand. Um, and also, we are all struggling with this. We are all struggling with quarantine, with COVID-19. Um, so making sure that you're reaching out for help um, when you do need it. We, again, like Becky said, support at docwayne.org is um, one of the ways to reach out to us. But just making sure that you're um, providing yourself with the same space that you're providing for the kids. Um, we also believe in movement breaks, brain breaks. If you feel like you've been sitting for too long, Zoom after Zoom after Zoom, get up, get a little stretch in. Um, we are big advocates of that. Um, and just for a couple logistics, um, if you want to, we are going to prompt you a few times to um, mention things in the chat. So um, making sure that you know where your chat feature is. If you have any questions for the panelists, trying to put those in the Q&A box. Um, we are going to, there are two separate spaces if you don't know um, the difference, then we're gonna be able to answer those Q&As. We're gonna have a break in the middle of the webinar and then at the end as well. Um, so we will be checking in with those. Um, unfortunately, I don't think our Facebook Live worked now, um, but if you do have any extra questions that weren't answered or that you didn't think of, again, just respond to support at docwayne.org. Um, we just wanna make sure that we are supporting everybody that we can and everybody's questions get answered. Um, I will also be putting up any social media um, just ways to contact us and to follow us um, in the chat as well. So if you are interested, um, just go ahead and follow those spaces. Miss Kendra, on to you. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what Samaritans is. We are a Boston-based nonprofit organization. Um, our main goal is to prevent suicide in a number of different ways. Um, those boil down to three main programs that all act, like I mentioned, in a, in a number of different ways. I currently work for the Community Education and Outreach Program. I manage that program. And so we're pretty similar to Doc Wayne in that we do a lot of work with youth. We're in and out of classrooms. We work with those who support youth, um, doing a lot of professional development. Anybody who supports youth and families, um, we want to be in to start this conversation about suicide and mental health. Um, we also do professional development for other community resources and things like that. Again, giving similar presentations in order to facilitate this conversation that can often be in the forefront of a lot of people's minds, but really difficult to get going. Um, we also provide a 24 hour helpline, which is something that we'll refer back to a number of different times throughout this presentation. Not only is it something that I'm incredibly proud of and something that I wanna give you all a little taste as to what it is and a couple of the helping tools that they use, but I wanna allow you all to be able to speak to it when maybe giving it out to students and to athletes um, that you work with. Um, but I wanna, like I mentioned, give you some of the skills that they use because you'll find that they're pretty doable. Um, one of the common misconceptions that a lot of people believe is that it takes a professional to know how to support um, students or anybody with mental health challenges. And as we go through kind of the second half of, of my portion of the presentation, you'll kind of start to understand that a lot of the tips that I have for you today are pretty graspable, are pretty doable by just about anybody. And so um, that's one of the things that I hope to share with you today. And then the third component of our organization is actually grief support. So it goes without saying that losing somebody to suicide is incredibly complicated. It comes with a lot of different layers and complexities. And so we offer a number of different support services for those types of loss that if you see my email address in the middle of your screen here, you're more than welcome to reach out to me, excuse me, to flesh out what some of those grief support services are, as well as any of our services. And just to speak to, um, this is a our webinar number two in a series. So I have dropped a link in the chat to um, our webinar number one for our kids in COVID-19 webinar series. Thanks, Amanda and Kendra. 
Um, and just to go over our agenda for the day, you'll see it on your screen, but wanna make sure that you all know that this time is for you. So please use the chat feature and the Q&A feature to let us know what your questions are. Um, and also feel free to email us at support at docwayne.org if there's other topics or other content that would be really helpful for you during this time. And um, also let us know while you have a moment um, where you're tuning in from today, from the United States or from across the world. Um, we just love to know who our audience is. So I'll pause for a moment as you do that. UK team, yes. It's great to see the, the worldwide power of sport here. So we have someone from England, triathlon coach, that's great. Well, um, we welcome you to continue using the chat feature and letting us know where you're uh, logging in from today. But as we move forward, just want to reinforce um, the true impact of this pandemic that we're all experiencing, as well as the gravity of this topic. Um, but um, as I get into that, just wanna also underline that we are, as Amanda was saying, speaking to kids um, and student athletes today, but certainly if you need help, please reach out. Um, and we will put the Samaritans um, crisis line on the screen um, towards the end, but we don't want to brush past that and want to be able to provide support to anyone. Um, and if you're not perhaps feeling suicidal, if you just feel like you need some extra support in your life, um, definitely utilize uh, Doc Lane for that. And we will either um, provide support ourselves or we will redirect that and provide a, an adequate resource in terms of mental health services. But um, as most of you know, um, the unemployment rate has skyrocketed in the United States. Um, and also um, as mental health providers, we're just seeing this increase in demand. And um, the World Health Organization is anticipating that this is gonna last a few years. So just trying to brace ourselves that this is not a sprint, um, that this is gonna be lasting quite a while. And Kendra can speak to this more eloquently, but um, the call volume is increasing substantially. Um, and there is um, some silver lining to this that we are in a collective experience. Um, so the empathy um, for others um, is increasing and people are understanding that people's mental health needs are something that needs to be um, understood and services are really important, but this is our topic today and this is just something that we all need to be gaining awareness from. But um, youth suicide prevention is a team effort. Um, this is not something that is only addressed by providers, but this is something that uh, we as a community need to address together. And um, youth sport coaches specifically are at a unique vantage point um, because of their relationships with kids. Um, so youth sport coaches, you all know this, um, I'm speaking to you and your world, but you know kids, um, you can observe their behaviors and their emotions, and you know when something's not quite right. Um, and research tells us that one of the most significant things in a kid's life is the protective factors um, with the adults that they trust. So stress isn't necessarily bad for kids, um, but the buffer that they have with strong, solid relationships is what gets them through that and potentially helps them um, increase their resilience and come out of that as a better, stronger person. But when they don't have that relationship, that's when stress becomes toxic to their brain. Um, so these coaches that are in their lives or teachers or paraprofessionals, or if you work in a community center, or if you're just in that role where you're helping kids, um, you're the one that can see what's going on. And so we just really want to elevate that experience and elevate that role and make sure that you understand how important you are in terms of this effort around youth suicide prevention. Um, 
especially in a time where kids are in their homes um, and we may not have eyes on kids all the time in terms of the folks that are usually watching kids um, out and about in the community. All right, so sport and suicide prevention. Um, the biggest thing that Doc Wayne does is making sure that we are providing um, people, whether it's adults or students or teachers with sport specific language to make sure that we are breaking down the stigma of things that happen in mental health, of suicide. We want to be able to talk about these things and it can be difficult to utilize some of the terminology and that clinical language. So we want to try to give people the language that they're already using, right? Um, so talking to you coaches, right? When we're talking to coaches, um, it's very uh, important within sports that we lean into the pain, that we steer into the pain that we are experiencing. We don't wanna ignore it. Um, it's there because, you know, thinking about weightlifting or training, we want to experience that pain to make sure that we can put, push past it, get stronger, feel stronger. Um, that pain isn't always going to be there, right? Um, so making sure that as coaches, we do understand these pieces of um, pain and sport and how they apply to the mental and emotional pain that we might be feeling as well. Um, and the big thing here too is that you as coaches have the ability to help. You guys are already helping, you're supporting. And if you can support a team through, um, you know, doing 10 sprints or, you know, having a uh, really difficult uh, conditioning week, then we can also support them through difficult mental um, and emotional um, things as well. So I, I like to think of this as an analogy um, of when we are working and training and pushing really hard and our you know kids are looking at us and like we can't do this anymore i want to stop like i have to stop we want to support them through it and say no you got this you know we can do this together we're not you know we're not going to stop the sprints just because somebody's having a hard time uh, but how do i support them how do we lean on our teammates how do we show through an entire collective that we can do this together because it's not that one person doing the sprints it's the whole team it's everybody and we're all working forward um, to make sure that we're all growing and, you know, successful and okay. And so um, if we can do this on the field, then we can definitely do it emotionally and um, just helping out our kiddos. Yeah, those are good points, Amanda. And um, with specific conversations around suicide, when someone discloses to you, um, the the immediate response is usually to steer the conversation in another direction. Um, but with this sports analogy, um, it's telling us to actually dive into that conversation, really try to determine what um, is truly going on for that young person and to um, not take the human approach of like, let's talk about something wonderful and happy, but instead we need to actually talk about what is happening for them and what is hard for them. Um, so I don't know if you want to chime in, Kendra, with your work on the crisis prevention lines at all. Yeah, that's one of the things that you can expect when you call any crisis centers. I mean, definitely ours. I've, I've gone through that training and answered a number of phone calls is that you're absolutely right. That's human nature is to want to get away from those painful things. But as a coach, you're trained to, again, steer towards them, know that pain is part of the process and know that to overcome that pain and work on it together and know that, yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's not something that we're kind of taught to do as humans and as helpers, but knowing that you, you kind of come out the other side, a stronger person, it's that same kind of, kind of work being done on the emotional side. So it's not comfortable. It's not something that we think is going to be helpful, but it is really something where you're allowing somebody to say, I'm here with you in this painful moment. I'm gonna sit with you, I'm gonna talk with you if that's something that you wanna do. If it's really just gonna be us sitting together in this painful moment together after you've just shared something incredibly uncomfortable with me, that's okay, but we are gonna get through it and come out on the other side stronger. So here's where I come in and talk a little bit about the statistics. I think the numbers aren't necessarily always everybody's favorite part, but they really do help paint the picture a little bit. So in the United States and actually broadly across the world, suicide is the number two leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 24. Now that number goes up a little bit when we talk about um, 
people who are disadvantaged, so people who are gay and lesbian, people who are um, of color, so people in um, disadvantaged communities, um, including, excuse me, people um, who are low income, people who are in the welfare system, people who are um, children of individuals who are imprisoned, people who are children um, who are adopted or in foster care, um, indigenous youth, you name it, uh, any disadvantaged population. Again, that number is exponentially increased. I could give you all those numbers, but again, not everybody likes statistics. Um, in cases of youth suicide attempts, four out of five children do show warning signs, which we'll cover warning signs in just a few slides. But that is worth mentioning because a lot of the times people think there's no way of knowing, there's no way of intercepting, these things happen and there's nothing I could have done. How was I supposed to know or what was I supposed to do? And part of that puzzle is really to identify the times in which things change a little bit, things happen. And so that's one of the pieces that I hope to give you a little bit of information on because there's a good chance that you're gonna be among the population of people who are gonna be able to notice just those little changes in behavior, those little pattern switches in which you might be able to step in and say, hey, as a coach, I noticed your energy levels are changed or you're showing up a little bit later to practice or your appointments than you normally would. Uh, but we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Um, 17.7% of high school students in the United States report having thoughts of suicide. Um, that's the year 2019. I was looking up some international statistics actually just this morning. Now that number drops to about 9.9% .9 of international students, but that's still one in 10. So that's a pretty big significant number to keep an eye on. And that's something that I wanna bring up as well as the rates that um, kind of exist between males and females. The rates um, among females um, attempting suicide tend to be much, much higher than males. Um, as you can see on the slide as well, males, or excuse me, females attempt about 4.34 more times than males, but males are dying about three times more than females. So females are attempting much more, but males are dying much more, and that boils down to the um, means that are happening there. It's also worth noting that female rates um, when it comes to losing their life are, are rising much, much slower than males. So males are dying by suicide again at a rate that is, is just increasing exponentially in, and in fact so fast that it's really, really hard to give you a number on, which is really, really concerning because males tend to be athletes, right? That tends to be kind of a societal pressure um, is, is kind of another tangent that I could go off on, um, but it is something that I think is worth considering. It's also worth noting that there is a lack of data kind of around the world that exists before the year 2000. So it is really worth um, thinking about kind of each individual person that you work with, uh, because there isn't a ton of data that exists in order to track rates and, and how things are working. So really consider your team, consider what you know about each individual player, uh, because that's really gonna give you more information than unfortunately I'm able to at this point. Next slide is good, thanks. Sure, and as Kendra moves forward, I also just wanna point out that we're all at increased um, risk right now because we're all experiencing a pandemic. So if you think maybe this is not me or this is not anyone I know, um, just remember that we're all under increased stress. Absolutely, yeah. So this slide is specific to the US, but again, as Becky just mentioned, it is worth noting that we've all got this kind of umbrella of stress hanging over us. So one in five youth in the United States will experience mental health symptoms over their lifetime. That number across the world um, extends to about one in eight. But again, that's pretty staggering and it is worth kind of paying note to. Uh, 6.1 million students in the United States are diagnosed with ADHD between the ages of two and 17 yearly. So if you do the numbers on that, that's pretty significant. That's a large number of students who are diagnosed. And, and ADHD is something that we're just starting to do some pretty comprehensive research on and how it ties to suicidality. But that connection is, is becoming a pretty strong one. And more than 50% of students with a mental health condition of any type are dropping out of high school. And this is something that we're identifying as a new trend and something that I really wanted to bring to the attention of the group because that's staggering to me and something that I wasn't aware of as being an issue. 
And if you really think about it, again, that's maybe a large majority of the population, that, and if not 100% of the population that you're working with, more than half of those students might end up dropping out of high school. And of course, that's not the goal. Hopefully, we're, we're increasing or decreasing that rate there. But you're really already working with a population who's likely to drop out of high school. And we know that leads to poor outcomes when it comes to just about every, every outcome, you know, lower job um, prospects. Mental health, mental health outcomes that could last a lifetime. We're looking at higher rates of incarceration. We're looking at any number of, of factors that are considered negative. And so it is really worthwhile to, again, get them while they're young and address topics that are really hard to address like this one. Now, 27% of high school students in the state of Massachusetts are reporting um, symptoms of depression. This number, as I've tracked it since the year probably 2015, has continued to rise and rise and rise, um, and pretty markedly too, about two or three percent every single year. Um, it won't surprise me if we hit a number, you know, above 33 percent in the next couple of years or so, especially with this pandemic happening. Um, it's really hard to not experience you know, symptoms of depression while this is going on, including a disrupted sleep schedule. Um, we're all kind of experiencing things like that now. And so it's really important, again, to identify these things, have conversations about these things. And even if you're not able to get some judgment about these things and really get the clear information, know that they're probably happening, at least while this is going on, or, or maybe know that they're more likely to happen. It's also worth noting that about 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness do begin by the age of 14. So that's pretty young when it comes to child development. But again, this is lifetime cases. So this is chronic mental illness that does last a student's lifetime, which is pretty incredible. And for the most part, it takes about 11 years for somebody who, from the onset of symptoms, to get access to adequate mental health treatment and even longer in some other countries. We are pretty fortunate in the United States to have a pretty large network of mental health providers and, and pretty quality care, but that is the same can't be said around the world, unfortunately. And so it's worth probably thinking about wherever it is that you're at. I know we've got a lot of people across the world. It's worth thinking about what that number might look like wherever it is that you are. Beautiful. Um, also, just to color this with a little bit more of what's happening in mm -hmm. our mental health organization right now, um, we have transitioned over from doing sport with our groups to having some telehealth groups, which has been lovely and wonderful. And due to like this stress, the added stress, there is a level of, uh, you know, difficulty that everybody is experiencing, but the people who, and the students who have experienced connection through sport with their coaches are actually taking hold of their um, groups and you know they're the ones that are running these groups that they have now they mm -hmm. are more centered towards um, speaking and opening up about what's going on for them right now um, part of that I think is due to the fact that we're all experiencing something similar so mm -hmm. it's very easy to have empathy towards that and to um, you know talk about those things and you're kind of taking something from a microcosm so a lot of the stuff that our kids or students are dealing with um, right now are being magnified because of this um, pandemic. So due to that, they are able to talk about maybe some of the things that they were dealing with before in a space because A, they've connected through sport with their coaches. B, they've been given a space um, to talk about this stuff and see like mm -hmm. we're having these um, really in-depth conversations. And so just providing that space for people who have connected with you in that way is going to give them, you know, something to say, especially right now when we're all experiencing a very similar um, level difficulty and stress. So um, just even speaking to that, that we are having a ton of kiddos that are dealing with um, these challenges, but if we are giving them a space to talk, they're going to take it and they're going to utilize it. So, um, you know, everybody out there has a chance to provide a space that's as special as that. Mm -hmm. Really good points. Yeah, absolutely. Next thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about are kind of common myths related to suicide. There are a wealth of those out there, and I just wanted to address some ones that I hear pretty regularly in my work. Um, the first is that talking about suicide and mental health will encourage negative outcomes. I hear this all the time, is that I can't bring this up because it'll encourage somebody to take their life. 
and that is just all the way around false. There have been so many studies that have proven this false time and time again. And it's actually true that talking about suicide um, and mental health is incredibly protective and productive, especially if you have that um, really strong relationship like coaches do with their athletes. You're bringing it up kind of like Amanda said in those groups with somebody that they trust, they have that strong relationship with. The fact of the matter is, is that sometimes parents don't have that trusting relationship. I know that when I was a student athlete, unfortunately, my parents weren't the ones that I wanted to turn to when I was struggling with my mental health. It was my coach that I felt a little bit more comfortable saying, there's a lot of pressure on me. I'm doing a full course load. I'm applying to college. I'm starting. I'm injured. I'm, you know, there were a lot of different factors. And that was the person that I had a little bit stronger relationship to that I felt more comfortable going to. And so it was a productive conversation because I was fortunate that that individual felt a little bit comfortable having that conversation with me. Um, and so I just bring this up because again, a lot of people are uncomfortable. They think I'll put ideas in their head and that's just not something that's possible. Talking about it again is one of the best things that you can do for somebody because it says, I don't think negatively because you're struggling with this. I don't think you're any less of a person. I don't think you're weird. I don't think you're a freak. I don't think you're any of these things. I think what you're going through is tough in these times. I think what we're all going through is tough. And I'm glad that you're talking to me about it. I'm on your team. I'm on your side in, in the sport and out of it. And I want to make sure that you're okay. And I'm glad that you're talking to me about it. Next myth that I hear quite a bit is that most suicides happen without warning. I talked about this a couple of slides ago. And the fact is about 70% of loss survivors are able to look back on their loss and say that they were able to identify some warning signs. So most of the time there are warning signs, like I said, we'll get to those in just a little bit, but that does still leave about a third of the time where there aren't, unfortunately. So I bring this up because again, overwhelming, you know, most of the time there are warning signs. I do want to pay a little bit of respect to the times that there aren't. But a lot of the times it takes knowing what to look out for. And then even more than that, having a little bit of confidence to, to point that stuff out because that's not a comfortable conversation to have all of the time. But I hope to give you a little bit of language as to how to do that, especially when you're not in the same physical space as somebody else. Because that's even harder to do is to say, hey, how are you sleeping? Because that's just a weird question to ask most of the time. But it is important. And we'll talk about, like I said, we'll talk about that in a few. Next myth I have is that if somebody is struggling, it takes an expert to help. And we've flushed this out a few times, but I wanna repeat it because it's worth repeating. Anybody can support someone at risk through skills they likely already have. And we'll review what those are. I'll go over a few things that maybe we need to tweak or reinforce a little bit, but it's likely that you have the language. It's likely that you have the skills. This is totally doable. It's nerve wracking for sure. It might take a little bit of confidence, a deep breath or two before you jump in, but it can be done. And then last one I have for you all says mental health conditions are treatable only through medication, only through therapy, only through going to the hospital. And those things can be helpful for a lot of people, but there are so many treatment options just like Doc Wayne that I am so fortunate to be able to work with and so fortunate to be able to learn about because it's such a great out of the box solution that has worked for so many individuals. And there are so many more that are constantly being developed that have really broken the mold for what treatment can look like, that it might just take a little bit of trying out and, and seeing what works and what doesn't to get somebody where they might need to be or at least closer to it. Next thing that we wanted to review are kind of some of the risk factors that we talk about when we talk about youth. Um, these are kind of what we talk about when we talk about red flags, as, as Becky mentioned, that was covered in a webinar prior to this one. Um, I'll let you all kind of read through these as I talk a little bit more about some ones that stick out to me. Um, these are ones that we see and we know about, you know, when we think back to our childhood and our struggling through adolescence. And these are ones that are still happening today. And one that isn't on this slide is of course the pandemic that we're going through and all the things that come with it. If we start to unpack that one, it's the lack of day structure, it's 
being in the house with people 24 seven, that maybe, you know, you just kind of start to create some friction. It's maybe an altered sleep schedule. It's maybe an altered diet. It's maybe a lack of exercise like we used to enjoy. It's maybe the telehealth services, which are going great, but again, it's a little altered. It's a lot of different things that all kind of fall underneath this umbrella. And it's really worth maybe sitting down if you're noticing somebody struggling and, and really thinking about they don't seem to be doing well with certain, you know, X, Y, and Z. Maybe we need to talk about those things, or maybe I just need to ask some questions. This pandemic is happening. What are the hardest parts for you? And really maybe pushing a little bit to ask, you know, probably you'll get, I don't know, I'm glad to not be going to school. Well, ask a little bit more, you know, press on a little bit because for me, you know, I, I like working from home. I get to wear sweats sometimes and that's always nice. But if somebody were to ask me and press a little bit, I would, I would have a lot to say. I'd say, you know, it's tough to not be able to go outside. It's tough to not be able to go to my local gym. I would have things to say, but it, it probably would take me a little bit of pressure to be able to open up about those things, just like it would for any kid who's probably much more resistant and a lot less chatty than I am. <laughs> Anything to add, Becky or Amanda? Yeah, so thanks for bringing up the previous webinar that we spoke about risk factors. And I just want to add, if you are um, perhaps not a coach, but um, an administrator of a youth sports organization, um, the last webinar talked about how to prepare your staff for hard conversations um, through developing a red flag list. So this is specific to suicide, but the conversation was about um, being on Zoom or on the phone and having a list for your staff. So if they're engaging in a conversation and something comes up for them, um, having a protocol in place for, the, for your staff to know what happens next. So do they call their supervisor or do they report something to the state or do they call the crisis line? Um, but providing them with that guidance. And I also just wanna acknowledge the questions that are coming into us. And we do have a space for questions in the middle and at the end. So we do see them um, and we will get to them. But Amanda, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm thinking of this when we were talking about this blanket um, stress that we're all feeling. Mm -hmm. That stress due to these certain risk factors is actually disproportionately affecting certain people. Kind of like Kendra is saying, I'm also appreciating working from home, wearing some sweats sometimes. Um, you know, I have a home that I get to be in that I appreciate the people that I live with. Um, that is not the case for every single person, right? Mm -hmm. Some of our kids may be homeless. Some of our kids might be um, working through some very complex familial issues. Even mm -hmm. as Becky and I were talking about yesterday, if you're experiencing positive um, relationships within your family, the fact that you are like relying on that relationship, maybe a little bit more or maybe too much, than you're used to, um, that can burn out that relationship. So I'm mm -hmm. um, just understanding that if you are like, well, quarantine's fine. Like I'm okay. I'm fine. Um, just remembering that certain risk factors are going to disproportionately add more stress to other people. So again, housing, socioeconomic status, um, you know, lack of social interaction with peers for people is difficult. Um, I think about just very young kids and young children who, when they're at the park, talk to everybody, right? They're running around, they're having a good time. That is now not an option. They have to go out and seek very specific individualized social, um, social interactions. And that's, you know, definitely contrived and different from how most of us grew up. So um, just understanding that these small little things and changes in a kid, a student athlete, anybody's routine is going to throw them off maybe more than we expected. Um, and so just making sure that that's uh, we're aware of that and that we're aware of whatever our stress levels are or the caregivers of those children, again, student athletes as well, um, that increased stress of the household can also have a really big impact. So it might not even be something that the individual is experiencing, but they're just experiencing the onset of everybody else being as overwhelmed as well. So just continuing to keep in mind all of the potential factors that could be happening and honoring someone and validating um, the difficult time they might be having when they do bring it up to you. Yeah, certainly. Um, so one of the hopeful parts of this webinar um, is that many of us are deeply engaged in sport uh, who are on the call um, or other parts of youth lives. And there are protective factors that we can put into place for kids. And one of them um, is athletics. So you can see on the screen um, some pieces that 
have been proven and there's research and data behind in terms of providing supports to kids. Now there are many others that you don't see on the screen that perhaps you're thinking of in your head of, well, absolutely that would help in terms of being a mitigating factor for suicide prevention. Um, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, but didn't put them up on the screen because couldn't find some solid data behind them. But you can see the greater social supports, the teammates, um, just the connections, um, having a coach in your corner. Um, we can see that the drug um, use for kids and teens um, involved in sport is lower and the risk for depression. Um, and that um, athletes' um, rates for suicide are lower than the general population. So as we work hard to develop those relationships um, and provide a supportive atmosphere for our athletes, please keep this in the back of your head that like this work is very important and vital in this effort around youth suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. um, one of the key factors in it, um, of course, is the intentionality behind sport. Um, and those relationships and also the safe space. So again, in the previous webinar, we touched on how to create safe space, but Amanda, can you just give us a brief run through on the key pieces of creating safe space? Yes. Um, so when I create safe spaces, I'm giving three mandatory expectations, which are safe words, safe bodies, and making sure that we're all talking one at a time. Um, I'm usually asking the students to create what the consequences of those things are so that they feel like they're fair. Um, they feel like there is a consequence to breaking whatever safe space we're trying to create. Um, and then just making sure that we have some kind of bullying policy um, or consequences to breaking these rules put in place prior to somebody breaking them so that we know what the consequences are, how do we handle this, and how do we you know, work things out to move forward. Great, and then just to build off that piece about like what does the research say around sport and prevention, um, here's a piece around preventative skill building. So if you have youth athletes, especially the younger ones, but it's still important as you go up through middle school and high school, um, the, these are the key building blocks to make sure that as they perhaps feel that social isolation and feel depression and anxiety and then feel that loneliness that we're all feeling right now in this pandemic, um, that if they start to feel um, suicidal ideation, maybe they can have some of those skills in their tool belt to be able to reach in and say, I know what to do in that situation, or I can reach out to someone for help. Um, and you see identity and belonging, critical thinking, connectedness. Um, just feeling connected is a big part of sport um, that isn't always listed in sort of the key skills that we see, um, but I think it's a big piece. And um, recently the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention reached out as they're trying to create a national plan around youth suicide prevention. And a piece of it is related to COVID-19, but also because of the surge in cases um, that happened even before this pandemic. Amanda, do you wanna to speak to one or two of these that you see on the screen and just yeah. how we actually teach these in sport so people have a concrete understanding? Yes, so I bet you all of you are doing at least half of these skills right now. Um, one of the big things that I really love to foster is identity and belonging. Um, we can do these things through rituals and routines. So routines are things like the structure of your practice. How are we um, putting in practice? Is it that we warm up? Do we check in? Do we see where people are at? How do we end practice? Do we end practice with, you know, recognizing people who really worked hard? Um, and those are kind of like the, or the routines. I love rituals. Rituals are my favorite things to be able to do within um, sport, within groups, um, because it really does add the, to this connectedness piece and makes you feel like you belong to the group. Um, a small, really small ritual that we do is every time somebody's birthday happens, we're gonna sing them happy birthday. That's a very easy, it's free, it's um, fun. And think about the smile it brings to people to be able to sing, you know, the person is gonna smile when you're singing to them, but everybody else is feeling connected together as we're singing. Um, and that's very small, 
but then we kind of uptick as we get into team culture. You know, is there a slogan that we have for our teams? Are there certain shirts that only people on the team get to wear? At Doc Wayne, we all wear our deep midnight blue shirts with our white writing. We have polos. Coach Becky is modeling a uh, zip up shirt, but I know that every time I leave my community and I'm walking around in this Doc Wayne shirt, that I belong to Doc Wayne, that I'm a part of Doc Wayne, and that helps me. Um, when I go back and think about my own high school experience as well, um, we had a slogan that was ours and it was fearless. And we each got a shirt that had our colors for soccer and it said fearless on the back. And that just gave us the power and the energy to know that like, this is a group of girls that is fearless and we're ready. And that's not even how we're just gonna live our lives on the field, but how we're going to live our lives on, off the field as well, and that we are fearless, and that we're ready, and that even off the field, not only are we fearless people, but we have these connections um, with everybody else too, which is super important. Um, speaking a little bit to self-compassion as well, self-compassion is one of my favorite things um, to teach. Uh, the only thing that we really need to do for that, I think, is re recognize that counterintuitively in sport, sometimes we think like we need to get um, down on someone. We need to really push someone to make sure that they understand that they need to do better or be pushed better. And we can't um, just be understanding and compassionate in order to drive someone forward. The difference in self-compassion is we're driving people forward through um, being really honest and open with the way that we're doing. And if we can be honest and open while getting rid of the shame and the difficulty it is to be honest, then we're able to grow a little bit better. So self-compassion is comprised of three things. Number one is just understanding that everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does. Michael Jordan makes mistakes. You know, Becky, our, my CEO, makes mistakes at times. Um, and so therefore I can make mistakes and that's okay. Um, then you go into mindfulness and just saying, all right, if everybody can make mistakes, what am I doing? What am I doing well? What am I doing that's difficult? And how do I move forward? Um, so those are a couple of the aspects of self-compassion and just kind of reminding ourselves to have compassion for ourselves, as well as teaching um, our students how to have compassion for themselves because we don't always foster that within sport. And we wanna make sure that people are growing because they want to grow, not because they feel like they have to grow in order to feel included. All right. That so. was wonderful, Amanda. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we're getting into some of our questions um, that we have. So I know that it was answered in here. Kendra, I don't know if you want to speak to it a little bit um, live. Uh, the question from Scott Murray that says, Kendra, any red flags as to why the 4.34 times figure for females? You mentioned sports pressure on youth males. Any key to consider around females? Yeah, I get asked this question a lot. So to remind everybody, um, females attempt suicide about 4.3 times more than males, but males die about three times more than females. And lethality of means tends to be a big factor in this, in this statistic. So boys tend to lean on more lethal means when it comes to suicide. And there's not a ton of research on why this is because a lot of it is kind of theory. It's really hard to test why this might happen. Um, and, and as I kind of flush this out, you'll probably understand why. A lot of it is probably societal pressure. We teach boys in this society things like boys don't cry. And we say things like man up. And we say things that kind of reflect those same values. And I'm not saying I agree with them. I'm not saying this is language that everybody should use. But I was reading a study fairly recently that said boys as young as six years old don't really see value in talking about their feelings because of some of these language things that we use and some of because of some of these norms that we reinforce. And so if I were a boy and I were kind of taught these things, whether it was consciously or unconsciously, it would make sense that if I were struggling with my mental health, I would probably be really unlikely to want to talk about it. And if I were really struggling, I'd probably want a really quick way to go, which is it's dark. I don't intend to really be dark with it, but but lethality of means for me would probably, you know, be something rather quick. We know that men are more likely to be firearm owners, you know, not again here to get political, but that's unfortunately um, why we see that statistic true as well. Whereas women are more likely to lean on less, le less lethal means. Um, and, and those lethal means tend to have a window of what I call interception. If I'm choosing something like poisoning, we have a little bit of time to again intercept and save a life there which is why we see that statistic as being true. That's a great question. I, for time, kind of skipped over that, but thank you for allowing me to clear that up. 
Thank you. Um, and then I think Becky, this is a good question for you. Um, if we're coaching minors, do we need parental permission to discuss certain topics of mental health? If not, how do we handle parents who give pushback to, on talks about suicide, for example? Okay, so that's a two-part question and would appreciate your perspective on this too, Coach Amanda. But um, I guess as a clinician, you need consent to treat. Um, but the, the question is about coaching. Um, you don't need consent to have a conversation with your athlete about mental wellness um, or how they're feeling, how they're doing, or the questions that Kendra is about to pose about how is your sleep, things like that. And in fact, like you should be asking those questions. If there's a disclosure around um, something around suicide or something really concerning, we'll touch on this later, but you shouldn't hold that. Um, and um, in many states, you're a mandated reporter. Um, so in, with that piece, you should start to involve the parent or guardian. Um, and that is a really challenging piece um, to have a trusted young person tell you something and then um, try to navigate that, which could be a whole webinar in itself. Um, but that it's important to not, um, not promise that you will hold secrets like that when you start to have conversations with young people um, and then have them tell you something that's that significant. Um, so that's, I would say that. And then what was the last part of the question, Amanda? Um, last part of the question is, if not, how do we handle parents who give pushback on pushback. talking about suicide? Yeah. Right, right. Um, so that's really challenging. Um, I would always lead with, I care about your son or daughter, um, and I'm coming to you with this because I care so deeply about them, and then try to meet them where they're at and understand cultural differences. Um, and try to figure out, like, try to really listen and try to understand why they're thinking the way they are because they do, they do love their child and um, they want the best for them no matter what the conversation is about and try to come up with a plan that um, provides safety and is um, a middle ground. Amanda, would you add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is just reminding people that like safety is paramount. Safety mm -hmm. is above all. We want to make sure that someone is alive to be mad at you later. Um, yeah. And that is, um, I think I've said this to a couple of different one of my clients in the past that it's okay if you're mad at me, but I'm here to keep you safe. And that is my job. And that is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so it sounds a little harsh, but at the same time, you know, I'm personally comfortable with people being mad at me as long as I can keep them safe. So um, that's a really big piece of it. And just remembering that um, if you are a mandated reporter, look that up for whether it's your state or your country, that's an important piece to have um, and to understand. And then if you are that, again, you are the mandated reporter, you are the person that um, is obligated to make sure that this kid stays safe. And um, I'm assuming that you all love and care about your kids. So um, if you care about yours half as much as I care about mine, then you're also going to want to um, make sure that you're keeping them safe. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate your questions. Um, we want to be mindful of time, but um, Kendra has a lot of really helpful information for us. So we're going to continue through the webinar. Um, we will likely go past time, but if you need to leave us, um, please feel free to do so. And the recording will be posted on our YouTube page. So we hope you stay, but we understand if you have to go. So like I mentioned, I want to talk just about a few warning signs. I'm not going to go through all of these because I think a lot of them are, are pretty self-explanatory, but I do want to go through a couple that especially are pertinent now. Um, the first category that we have are, are verbal warning signs, which unfortunately don't tend to be very common. Um, these tend to look like jokes about death, dying, or suicide. These tend to look like indirect statements like, I don't know how much longer I can do this. Um, I'm tired of all of this, things that tend to actually be a little bit more vague than we might like. And with statements that are a little bit vague, it makes a lot of sense to ask clarifying questions. It can be as informal as, well, what do you mean by that? Or what exactly is that? Or, or something, again, kind of informal. It doesn't have to be 
super pressing. It doesn't have to be super, you know, interrogation-y. It doesn't need to be um, stop everything and let's, let's have a conversation about suicide, but ask a clarifying question. Student could totally, you know, flip gears and, and say, oh, I'm just tired of practice. I want to go home and that's okay. But you ask that clarifying question to get a better sense as to what that meant. And that's, that's going to be a good first step to take. Kendra, can Next I add something category to that? that we have are the physical warning signs with this telehealth and, and virtual reality that we live in now. These are going to be especially hard to identify. These look like changes in weight, appetite, hygiene, appearance, and sleep. So these are going to be the, the physical warning signs that you are going to have to ask the direct questions about. How are you sleeping? How are you eating? What does your daily schedule look like? Um, you know, are you eating your three meals? You know, what'd you eat for dinner last night? Again, kind of informal questions that are gonna give you a lot more information than the athlete thinks you're getting. And that's gonna be really an important step as to how to ascertain kind of what might be going on behind the scenes. I'll give you some more language as to how to maybe do this in, in a slide or two. Next category that we have are the behavioral warning signs. So declining school or work performance, again, asking about grades, asking how the online school is going, that's gonna give you some information that could be really helpful. Impulsive behavior, this can look like seeking out substances or seeking lethal means. Um, again, because you're not in the same physical space, really listening for those verbal cues. This one's a little bit harder to ask questions about because kids are pretty in tune when you start to pry about this stuff. But if you're in contact with the family, it might make a little bit more sense when you know somebody carries a history of this stuff to ask those questions. Um, losing interest or pleasure in the hobbies and activities that somebody used to enjoy. Now, this one I ask you to kind of weigh, is it losing interest or is it just the inability to do this stuff? You know, they're not able to go and play team sports right now, but that doesn't mean they're not interested. They're not able to watch the Celtics on TV all night, but that doesn't mean they're not interested. Really kind of using your best judgment to understand, is this something, again, that they're not able to do or that they really don't want to do anymore? Um, giving away prized possessions, putting one's affairs in order. This can look a lot like just saying goodbye. Um, I once, just to tell a brief story, had a friend who logged on to Facebook and started sending really sweet kind of goodbye messages that didn't really look like goodbye messages. And I didn't know enough at the time to ask what was going on. So I learned a few days later that he attempted suicide. And again, had I known, I probably would have asked, this is a little out of character for you, what's going on? So if you notice kind of strange out of character messages like that happening, it's worthwhile to just say, this doesn't seem like you, you know? What's going on today? Again, doesn't have to be super formal. You don't have to take it to, this is a warning sign for suicide. Let's talk about it. It can be, it can be relatively informal just to get the conversation going in a way that still feels comfortable for that person, but does start the conversation. Um, this can look like extreme mood swings, um, including a sudden mood lift after a down period. Again, this one's a little harder because, again, we're all going through mood shifts. We're all going through a down period, but really using your best judgment. You're all very intelligent people, and I trust you all to kind of, kind of keep an eye on this one. Extreme mood swings, meaning maybe unprovoked violence, unprovoked anger, things like that, um, that you might notice in a video chat or in something like that. Um, withdrawing from friends, family, or society is gonna be a big one. Um, we're all constantly trying to stay connected via Zoom, via video chat, FaceTime, whatever medium you're using. Is somebody canceling appointments, somebody blowing you off, somebody not responding to texts or picking up your phone calls, that's gonna be a big one right now. Uh, because you're not able to see each other face to face, continue to try to make those connections, continue to try to connect with families if you're able to, and really try to ask questions about this one. You know, I've noticed you missed our last few appointments. That to me says something might be going on and I wanna check in. And that would be a really good avenue to start asking some questions about some of the other things that we chatted about just a second ago with some of these other warning signs, because chances are if they're withdrawing, you're gonna probably identify some of these other things as well. Any other things to add, Becky? Yeah, and just about the verbal piece, um, I've noticed again, just by being around youth a lot, that uh, the Gen Z um, generation has kind of picked up on um, utilizing suicide mm -hmm. as humor and kind of 
really kind of speaking to what you're saying, like it can be just a joke um, and a coping skill even, like to be able to joke about it, to not think about it so seriously. Um, so if we are hearing those things, like Kendra is saying, um, making sure that we're paying attention to it and asking a clarifying question, but that clarifying question doesn't have to be, are you really gonna kill yourself? Does it, it doesn't have to be so intense, um, but just that first initial clarifying question is pretty informal. How is it going? How are you? Like, are, are you serious? Like, how are you feeling? Um, and seeing what the response is. If the response is like, oh, they fall down, you know, then that's something we want to pay attention to. If they're like, oh my God, like I was just kidding, like relax, be like, all right, that's fine. And mm -hmm. so just making sure that we are paying attention to those things um, and that that is a sense of humor and a form of humor. We don't necessarily want to like squash that and forbid it um, because it can be a coping skill for some people. So um, just acknowledging that even if it makes you uncomfortable that it might be helping somebody else out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are you okay? That's how yeah. I tend to respond when I have friends who use that as a joke. Chances are, if you do that enough, they'll probably cut that out. And I'm a little biased, but I think that's a good thing. I think that's not a joke that I'm a fan of. And having that removed from your lang from their language is is going to be a good thing because you won't have to worry about it anymore. Right, and just want to point out, especially with the athletic community, that um, with warning signs, it's important to know the baseline. So. Um, it's hard to know if something's concerning around weight and sleep um, and mood swings and things like that if you don't truly know your athlete. Um, right. So you got to know what's normal for them to know if something's a warning sign. Mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned a lot of this stuff as we went over the warning signs, but again, just to reiterate, just to repeat some of these things, ask these questions that don't seem normal that don't seem like questions you would ask when you're in person with somebody because you'd see them or because they would probably come up you know with the sleep schedule you'd probably see how somebody's energy is looking or maybe they'd mention being tired versus a video chat maybe you're meeting at noon they got to sleep in maybe they went to bed at one and woke up right before you answered they answered the phone call and you know you don't really get to see that stuff but it can be really really important to check in about this day structure the schedule checking in about the self-care are they engaging in anything that looks like self-care these are really really important questions to add into your conversations just to get some information about potential warning signs about some of those protective factors we checked in about just a few minutes ago really really important info to gather kind of all the way around Some of the risk mitigating factors that I think we covered really well at the beginning um, when Amanda was speaking about some of the ones really highlighted uh, by Doc Wayne. Um, the really, really big one that I want to focus on just for time's sake is that connected piece. Time and time again, every webinar that I've attended, every training that I've gone to says feeling connected is the number one thing that prevents suicide. If somebody feels connected to their environment, to the people that they spend time with, to their neighborhood, to their church, to their team, to their community, to their workplace, to whatever, they're gonna be at lower risk for suicide. And so you are all on this webinar because you facilitate a connection with your athletes and with your students. And so hopefully you can take that with, you know, a little bit of comfort knowing that you're facilitating that connection and just that alone is gonna be protective in a, an incredibly important way. You know, as somebody who really, really struggled with mental health in high school, I can't speak enough about how protective it was for me to have a team I was connected to, a coach, a, you know, a series of coaches I was connected to and a trainer that I was connected to. That was an incredibly important string of connections that I had that really did help keep me safe. And so that's just the one thing on this slide that I wanted to highlight, but all of these are important to kind of take a look at as well. Um, you know, the hobbies and interests, that's a, of course another relevant piece. Um, the life skills are being developed. And, and again, that slide that Amanda covered a few slides ago was, was incredibly important as well. So these are again, some of the tips that I wanna give you all um, just briefly, I don't wanna run over too much, but I do wanna give you some language that I think can be very, very helpful in supporting somebody who's going through a tough time. We've said it before and I'll say it again, we're all going through a tough time right now. And so I wanna give you a little bit of foundation um, when it comes to language in order to support somebody um, who maybe discloses to you that they're going through a tough time or maybe as your engaging with them uh, via Zoom or via your preferred video conferencing uh, platform. Uh, maybe as you're asking these questions that we've encouraged you to start asking, they kind of start to disclose that they're struggling. 
here's maybe some tips that you can use in order to support them a little bit better. Maybe um, these are some things that you already are doing, which is wonderful. Maybe these are some skills that you've learned, you know, back when you were five years old and, and working on listening when you were just starting out in school that maybe we need a little bit of practice on. I know in my personal life, I still struggle, so no hard feelings, but uh, we'll go ahead and move forward and, and kind of re-go over some listening, which does sound silly, I'll admit that. <laughs> So we've broken this up into do's and don'ts, and I just want to highlight some of my favorite pieces when it comes to listening do's. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is letting somebody express their feelings. This is, of course, you know, it goes without saying, but the first thing that we do when listening sometimes is when somebody gets emotional or somebody starts sharing something painful, is just like we talked about at the beginning, we want to make it better. As helpers, we want to jump in and say, well, at least this happy thing happened, or at least it's sunny outside, or <laughs> at least I made your favorite meal tonight, or, you know, we want to make it better. Let somebody share with you that they're going through a hard time. Let somebody finish talking before you jump in. Let somebody even sit with that sadness and silent for a little bit. Let somebody cry if they're going to cry. I think one of the hardest things for me is that I grew up in a family where if I started to get emotional, my parents would say, don't cry, don't cry, we don't cry. And that was really, really tough because I'm a big crier. <laughs> I'll be honest with you all, I'm a crier. And so one of the most valuable things that I learned when I was learning to take helpline calls was if somebody called us and couldn't say a word but was crying on the phone, let them cry. And I'll share that with you because you, you don't know what might be going on in a student's home or an athlete's home. They might just need a little bit of time to just cry. Let them do that. Going along with that is listening without judgment. Now, whether or not you realize it, judgment happens, and that's okay. We all kind of learn to judge in both positive and negative ways, and it's really, really important to both get in touch with that judgment and to learn how to push it back down when it starts to creep up. So again, another brief story. I once had somebody call me on the helpline in tears, and he said to me, you know, I just went to Subway, the sandwich shop, and I got a sub and I bit into it as I was, you know, turning on the big game tonight and there were no pickles on it. And I'm just devastated. And I was like, and again, the judgment crept up before I even could rein it back down. And I had to sit for a second and, and say, okay, what would I say if I, you know, what I want said to me if I were on the other end? And I believe I said back, it's really hard to set your expectations and not have that be met. Because it is, we can all relate to that. We've all thrown ourselves a birthday party and not had it go as well as we thought. We've all you know, had expectations and when they don't quite go to plan, it's a hard feeling. And you could hear the sigh of relief and he started to pour some other heavy things that he was going through. And I think if I had shown any amount of judgment that phone call wouldn't have gone as well as it did. And he was going through some pretty heavy things. And it was really, really important for me to check my judgment, again, to push it down, to sit with some silence, and then to take it out of the room and, and really connect with myself and say, okay, what can I say back? And that's, that's a difficult thing to learn how to do, but it's doable. And again, it does come with sitting with some silence, which is always uncomfortable. But I trust that everybody's still on this chat and everybody who was here before can do that. The next few things are things that are more important in person, but can still be important when you're on video chat. I especially like the one that says paraphrasing what you hear, letting somebody talk for a long time. You know, sometimes it can be hard to tune in and tune back out and you've got a million things going on. What can be really important to keep yourself engaged, but to also show the other person that you're engaged is to repeat back what, the, what it is that they're saying to you. You know, you're, you're, again, you're challenging yourself to stay engaged, but you're also saying, this is what I heard. Is that correct? And they can say, well, you didn't quite get it right. Let me, let me re-clarify. Or they can say, yep, you got it. Let me move on. And that's a really comforting kind of element of control that you're giving them in a way that maybe they don't have anywhere else, which is really empowering. Now, we also use validating statements, things like, that sounds really hard. That sounds really challenging. Tell me more about that. And that doesn't take a lot of effort either, right? You're not saying, I totally understand that because there's a real, real chance that you don't. You're not saying, I've gone through that too, or I know somebody who has, because this isn't about that. This is about supporting the person who's in front of you. 
Now let's move on to the don'ts column. I really want to zero in on those first two points. We, talk, we say don't talk about yourself or reflect on your own experiences. I kind of want to throw that out for the purposes of this chat because you have real strong relationships with the people that you work with. Right, you develop relationships with the athletes that you coach, and it can be really validating for them to hear that you have been through something similar. So what I say, and I know this kind of goes against the validation point, but what I ask you to do is to really weigh in your mind before self-disclosing, is this for me or is this gonna be helpful for them? Is this something where I just kind of want to share and take some of the stage? Or do I really think that this is gonna be valuable for them to know that Somebody on the other end of this connection has gone through something similar. Maybe I can offer a little bit of advice. Maybe it's just a bond of knowing that we've gone through it as well. You know, let, let's kind of think about it before I just go ahead and do it. And you, you'll come to the right conclusion. Maybe you won't, and maybe you'll need to kind of backstep, but, but it is kind of a trial and error. But again, I, I trust you all, you're all smart. <laughs> uh, the next piece is kind of related to that one. It says, don't give advice or try to solve problems. We say this one again because we're all helpers and that is kind of a first or second instinct is to say, hey, you're going through something difficult. Let me help you. Let me not listen to you. Let me, you know, you've said your problem. You don't need to say anything more. I have a solution. And so we don't want to cut them off and say, nope, I understand completely. I got it from here. Here's how you fix it. We want to let them talk. We want to sit on our advice. But what I say now is, Maybe you're just so ready to burst with this advice that you can't stand it anymore. Ask what I call a buffer question. That question looks a lot like, I can tell you're really struggling with this and I think I have some advice. Do you wanna hear it? Or can I coach you? I learned that one from Becky when we chatted earlier. Can I coach you? Do I have permission to coach you right now? And let that student, again, have a little bit of control to say, yeah, actually you can. Or nope, I'm not in the mood today. I'm not ready for it maybe next time we meet. And again, a little bit of control can go a long way for somebody who's struggling. Now the next four points on my slide here are often not things that are done in, in you know, verbal language, unless you call my mom up with a problem and then she'll kind of repeat this stuff verbatim, but that's a whole other point. These are often done in tone, right? We need to really check our tone when we talk to somebody because if they interpret that I think it's just a phase, I think it'll pass, they're not gonna to wanna to talk to me anymore. They're not gonna think that I'm taking this seriously, that I think that what they're going through is challenging, and that's really gonna sever our relationship in a way that is really, really difficult to get back. Uh, Becky or Amanda, anything to add or? or um, for I think these are all beautiful points. I just wanna acknowledge the comment from Scott here. He's just pointing out that coaches absolutely have these skills and they're great at motivational interviewing. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, they are. They're, this is why they're great coaches because they, mm -hmm. they know this stuff and they're, they're, they're amazing at it. Um, but just also like some of this isn't feasible if you're dysregulated. Um, so if you come into this and try to like practice these skills and you're not in a place that you can be present, um, that's what you, you have to do that work before you implement these skills. Um, so Absolutely. even if that's just like a clearing breath, a deep breath, um, and then you dive into the conversation, um, that's perfect. And that's what needs to happen for people. Cause you can't regulate someone else if you're dysregulated, but Amanda, really point, think? Gabby. yeah, I want to touch on the tell them it's just a phase, uh, because I think there's a difference between a very dismissive this is just a phase, you'll be fine. And just kind of really skipping over the uh, current moment and the mindfulness of what's going on with this person right now and what they're dealing with. And so it's just a phase, it'll be fine. Like that could be true, potentially, who knows? But, mm -hmm. you know, thinking back to the original slide where I was speaking to, like, it's not just about it being a phase, it's about recognizing the pain that they're in in the moment and what they need to do in order to overcome said phase. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I understand that you're experiencing a ton of pain, you know, you're one of my star apps and every time we go and do sprints, you're out there encouraging everybody else, making sure they're getting through it and that they don't quit. Now it's my time to do that for you. You can mm -hmm. do this. We can do this together. You know, I want to make sure you're not quitting because there will be a light at the end of the tunnel eventually. And I think that that's a different conversation than a very dismissive. This isn't just a phase. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Both really good points. Thank you. 
these are more language tips because it is a little bit altered when you're talking to somebody a little bit younger. I am a big advocate for some transparency when you're talking to younger people because I think a lot of decisions, especially when related to mental health care, get made kind of over the top of a young person. You know, we think that they're too young to be included. Let's just sign them up for a therapist and, and ship them off to the appointments and, and they'll just do it and that'll be fine. We'll get them meds and that'll be, that'll be good and they'll be fine. It, it can be really, really important to say, you know, there are people that can help with this stuff. And that might look like therapy, that might look like getting you involved with different programs, that might look like meds, th that might look like a bunch of different other things. Let's do some research together. Let's look into different resources. We can try different things out. Let's have, let's continue this conversation. And I want to be open and honest with you about this. Facilitate that conversation from the get-go because that's really going to in increase the chance that you're going to hear back from, from your student, this isn't quite working, or I'm still struggling with this aspect. You know, this isn't a one-time deal that you need to have this conversation. This should be something that's kind of ongoing. I think that's one of the big mistakes that um, I really struggled with in high school was my parents thought it could be a one-time thing and then I'd be good to go where it needed to be kind of an ongoing check-in situation. Yeah, I got connected to a therapist. Yes, certain other things happened and, and you know, but they weren't really ever included in those conversations. We had that one, you know, kind of starting point and then I was kind of on my own versus if we had a conversation and they kind of were engaged in every step, I think I would have felt comfortable again, kind of saying this part doesn't feel good. I'm still really working through this. I really want to research this with you, you know, kind of include them in the conversation because I think that really does lead to both building that connection and then continuing to make it stronger, but letting that student know that they have a little bit of agency in the care that they're receiving. Again, I'm all about that control. A lot of the times with this stuff, students might not feel like they have a ton of control. So increasing some of that control can be really important. Yeah. I also wanted to share with you all um, just what safety planning is. Not to tell you that you have to design this with your students, but just to remind you all that you might be included in somebody's safety plan. When we talk about internal and external coping strategies and people they can ask for help, that very well could be you. So don't be surprised if somebody's saying, hey, I'm struggling and, and you're somebody that I can ask for help. That's a great thing to be included in a safety plan and you might not know it, um, but that's a really great tool that somebody can have in place, maybe designed by a therapist. And, and just kind of wanted to bring to light that this is a tool that somebody could be using. Yeah, exactly. Um, you um, hit the nail on the head there. And um, often I find they're not spoken about as much as would be helpful to the team approach, but they're similar to um, t athletes having treatment plans in the athletic training room or in the OT space and uh, they're great things to be aware of and to approach it like a team. So the, the coach is part of it, the parents part of it, the teachers part of it. Um, Amanda, do you want to talk about what this looks like in real time? Yeah. Um, so every time that somebody discloses some kind of um, what Kendra was saying, like a verbal, usually it's verbal um, within a one-on-one -on -one therapy session. But if you're noticing like some really concerning warning signs, I will have a kid do safety planning, even if they're kind of giving a passive uh, mention of suicide, um, I will do this with them. Just it's somewhat harmless and it helps people kind of recognize what are the coping strategies that I have. If I am getting to a space where I feel really uncomfortable, these are the things I can lean on. Um, so I can do this verbally, um, I can do this on paper, but I think the really big pieces of it that I'd like to highlight are utilizing the language that the um, teen or student um, is using. So don't shy away from saying the word suicide. If they're talking about killing themselves, you want to use those words um, because you don't want them to feel any shame or difficulty around this space. Uh, uh, we want the child or the person in question to be creating this themselves. So what are the coping strategies that they really align with? You can't just say, well, you're pretty good. Like you've done yoga before. Let's write yoga in there. Cause we don't know what the um, communication between those two people might be. So or between them and that activity could be, we just want to make sure that they um, are ready and around. Um, let's see what else is I'm thinking of people that I can ask for help. So when we're asking a student to 
create their own safety plan and we're asking them who are the people you can talk to very often someone who's in a very low space is going to forget and they're gonna, not gonna know who to say. So we do wanna offer them um, some options and some choices. Who are the people we can talk to? You know, it can be a peer, it can be an adult, it can be anybody that they feel comfortable with and we wanna make sure that they are providing those people but that we might need to give them a little assistance and a little help. And if you know, like if you've heard them talk about friends, if they're on a team, putting some of those people that they are connected with um, because it can be difficult to think of those things in that time. Um, and then, the last thing that I really like to make sure is that there's a statement at the end that just states like, I promise to keep myself safe and healthy until the next time I'm able to see this person. And then I have them say that statement out loud. Um, even if that's the one thing that you're doing with someone because you're a little bit concerned, that is a definitely a really good thing to have in your back pocket as a coach is saying, can you promise me that you can be safe until the next time I see you? Um, that person can say, yes, I do promise. And even if there's a moment where they're like thinking about harming themselves in any way, you can be the little voice in the back of their head saying, oh, I promised my coach and I care about them. So I'm going to do this. And there's a little bit of an extra reason to hang on and a little bit of an extra reason to treat yourself well. Um, so I think that that's a really great piece to add in there. And um, I do it with all of my kids. And if it's a safety plan that we made a while back, I might even have them reuse the phrase. Yeah, those are great points, Amanda. Um, I also just want to make sure people are aware that we had to change a lot of safety plans when uh, COVID-19 came up because the coping skills they used previously um, weren't available. So if you've done this before and this is old hat, just make sure that you go back and you look at those because the world has changed entirely. Um, so we're um, about to wrap up, we have a couple more things. Just wanted to hit on student athletes. So athletes who are in college or beyond, and just a few things to consider um, around suicide prevention is, we talked about this on the webinar throughout, but just truly knowing your athletes. So knowing when um, what their baseline is so that you know when something has gone awry. Um, and considering housing arrangements. So there's a number of universities um, that have solo housing and also limited sunlight. Um, so they don't have a lot of windows um, or there's not a lot of community space. And perhaps they've done this for study reasons um, or for a variety of reasons, but it really causes isolation. Um, so just being aware of where your athletes are living and um, the amount of interaction they have with others. And again, going back to know your athletes, like some people that doesn't have a lot of impact on them and other people it does. Um, and then using a pre-screen. So when they come in for their physical um, prior to the season, there's some really quick pre-screens. And actually this could be adapted to the youth sport environment. A um, couple quick questions. Um, how are you doing? Is there anything you want to check in about with someone that you trust? And also just there's a couple points in athletes lives that are really tough. One is injuries, especially career ending injuries, and then transitioning out of sports. So their identities are certainly wrapped up um, in their athletic involvement. So not understanding or like not being able to process like what happens afterwards and then with COVID-19 we're seeing a lot of this around loss of seasons um, and especially the seniors in high school and seniors in college and then also the fall season the fall athletes really not knowing if they're going to be able to return to sport and what that's going to look like if their season is going to start and then stop and then start and then stop. Um, so just having some general awareness of that. And then in terms of reporting and who you're directing people to for mental health concerns, being aware of playing time. So if you're directing um, your athletes to the head coach to say, um, you know, raise your hand if you need something and that person has the power over their playing time, you're gonna see less reporting. Um, so if there's an athletic trainer or they can go directly to the university health services and not have to interact with the head coach, or if there's a captain or an assistant coach, um, just think about all of those things. And um, more and more they're implementing resiliency training for student athletes to 
build up those coping skills, which is very similar to the building block conversation that we had earlier around the power of sport and those pieces that really help um, young people build those skills around sport. And as you can see there, suicide is the third leading cause of death. Um, so this is not, not something to think lightly of. This is certainly an issue of, of significance. Um, so as we like to do at Doc Wayne, um, we, we certainly speak sport and we think that is, uh, sport is the language of youth, but also the language of the globe and it reduces stigma um, for everyone. And there's certainly some stigma around suicide um, and mental health. So we came up with a few ways that you can see on your screen um, to talk about this. And we don't mean to minimize um, mental health or, or, or suicide. If you, know, if you feel comfortable talking with those words and that language, certainly do. But as coaches, I know like sport language just rolls off your tongue and wanted to provide you these um, to assist in your, in your talk with your kids. And one I just wanted to explain, I, I know you can see the other three, but be a captain um, is a little bit hard to understand and our thoughts around that were something that Amanda spoke to earlier were that sometimes as a captain you have to make hard decisions. And not everyone agrees <laughs> and not everyone follows along immediately and sometimes also, you have a different perspective than everyone else, and you can kind of see the larger picture. Um, so that's sort of the idea that safety is number one, and sometimes you have to um, do the best for your teammates, and you have to do the best for those who are in your care. Um, and that's what being a captain is. Um, so I'll leave the other three on the screen. We don't need to go through them, but... Um, that's in the spirit of Doc Wayne. We always speak sport um, and we feel like it's the most powerful thing um, with kids. So here's our resources. Um, I'll skip over Samaritans. You can go back to that Kendra, but in terms of Doc Wayne, um, right now we're with telehealth, but feel free to reach out to us at support at docwayne.org. Um, and I also um, wanted to highlight the best team. So they're not on here. Um, but in terms of crisis um, evaluation and treatment here in Boston, and I know they're also in Fall River and I believe Springfield, but you can look them up on their website. They are absolutely amazing and very, very helpful um, for youth. And I know Amanda has called them many times, as has everyone on our team. Um, but Kendra, do you want to touch on Samaritans as we start to wrap up today? Yeah, just one last time to repeat what I said at the beginning. Um, the number that you see kind of at the top left there is the number for our 24-hour helpline. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year by phone or by text, which is a really cool feature for this, uh, especially the younger, younger crowd. Um, we have a really great pool of, of individuals who are taking phone calls and texts remotely. We were able to figure out how to do that. So people who are working around the clock to be able to support members of the community, no matter what happens, come pandemic, come snowstorm, <laughs> come whatever may happen, um, people are taking those phone calls and texts to be sure to support everybody. So please feel free to hand that phone number out. Um, if you have students who do not speak English as their first language, right next to it on the right side is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. If you dial that 800 number, which is not available by text, you can hit two and that'll connect you to a Spanish speaking operator. Wonderful. And as mentioned in the beginning, this webinar is part of a larger series called Kids and COVID-19. Um, this is episode four um, and webinar two. So if you missed the previous ones, you can visit our YouTube page um, under Doc Wayne and the handle is actually Doc Wayne DTG. Uh, so there should be four there. And then we have some upcoming sessions that you can see listed. Um, and certainly I'd be happy to share them with you directly if you send an email to support at docwayne.org. And um, with that, um, I would be happy to stay on for any additional questions, but um, if you're leaving us now, I wish you the best and hope you stay healthy and happy and have a great rest of your day. But um, we will stay on 
and take any lingering questions that you might have. All right, there is one question from D. Murray saying, do you encourage the YP to write the plan and have it accessible to them? Do you, uh, are we talking about the youth, I'm assuming? D, or if D is still here, she can clarify that. I'm, so if I do have the youth um, have a treatment plan, I write out a structure and then I have them fill in um, the spaces. We'll do it together. So we usually do it verbally while they're writing it down. Um, I will take a picture of it to make sure that I have it as well for my records to make sure that we did it. Um, I will also send that out to different providers provided that um, I have the permission to do that, um, whether it's legally on a form or verbally from the student and then, um, yes, they will take that and have it accessible to them. They should, whether it's on their phone, I do have them take pictures of it. Like there's a bunch of different ways for them to hang on to it. And I try to provide them with as many um, options as possible. There's actually a study that says if a student has it on their phone, they're like 37% more likely to take a look at it or something. So that's yeah. a great tip that you have to take a picture of it and send it directly to that student. So just to chime in there. <laughs> Even like I think about just small things of setting it as your phone background, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's small little intricacies of um, technology that we can use to make sure that um, we're getting the most mileage out of something that we're trying to do to prevent some harm. Right, and I know there are certain apps being developed. I don't know that there's a comprehensive safety plan, but there's, I'd have to look up. There's one called My3 with just a couple of contacts and then you set in three um, coping skills that you can use and three um, like professional resources you can use. So you have nine, like three total for each or something and you can scroll through. I'll have to look it up again, but it was a really interesting like way to kind of combine the two, but also make it visually appealing. Um, and that so was really an app cool. you said? Yeah. And it's called? My three. I think there's a website and, and there's a way to download it on the app store for both Android and iPhone. We love that. A lot of cool apps like um, one related to self-harm, which is really cool. Um, that one's called Tech Tech. I've also yeah. seen Calm Harm is um, mm -hmm. another app that's really great and it gives you different activities to do instead of self-harming. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, that's all the questions that we have. Um, so Becky, I don't know if you wanna close it out for us. Yeah, sure. I just wanna thank Kendra um, and Samaritans for partnering with us today. And as always, thank you Coach Amanda for being a wonderful teammate. And um, to our listeners today, appreciate you all for taking the time to build your skills and awareness of suicide prevention and mental health during this pandemic. And um, I just encourage you all to take the time for yourself um, because this is certainly a difficult time. Um, and just to repeat again, we're here for you. So our contact information is support at docwayne.org and Kendra is um, put out her information as well, but we will broadcast it out too on our follow-up email. Um, and I hope you all stay well and stay happy and healthy and take care from Doc Wayne. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.